On March 21st, 1986, Ray Cox drove to the East Texas Cancer Treatment Center where he was set to undergo a regularly scheduled treatment. Ray would receive 180 rads of radiation for a tumor developing in his back, just left of his spine. Five months later, this gentleman was dead. The East Texas Cancer Center incident was just one of six radiation-related injuries and deaths from 1985 to 1987. The common theme in all these events, the Therac-25. It's not easy to treat cancer. Treating cancer effectively has been a hard problem in the field of medicine for several decades. The medical industry spends billions every year in research and development, attempting to make cancer treatment more effective and less invasive. In the mid-1970s, the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited Company, or AECL, developed a radical new double-pass concept for electron acceleration. The double-pass accelerator allowed new radiology machines to be more compact and perform two kinds of radiotherapy in one machine, X-ray therapy and electron therapy. This two-in-one package made the newly developed Therac-25 extremely attractive to hospitals, as it was easier and cheaper than the original Therac-6 and Therac-20. The Therac-25 was the first radiation therapy machine controlled entirely by software. Previous versions used software to make the interfaces more convenient, but still had hardware interlocks to operate the emitters. On March 21st, 1986, Ray Cox entered the East Texas Treatment Center to receive his 180 rads. He was taken to his room where he laid under the Therac-25 face down. The operator entered the control bay where she quickly entered the prescription data to the Therac-25 user interface. Because X-ray therapy was more common, the operator accidentally input X for X-ray. She quickly noticed and having operated this machine for more than 500 patients, very quickly changed the X to an E for electron therapy, which was prescribed for Ray Cox. After confirming the inputs were verified and the screen read beam ready, she hit B for beam on to begin the treatment. After several seconds of confusion, the machine shut down and displayed malfunction 54 on the screen. The screen also displayed a treatment pause error, which normally came from a low priority operator error that was easy to fix. The only documentation though presented about malfunction 54 indicated that there was a dose input 2 error, something an AECL technician would later indicate meant that the patient was given either too high or too low of a dosage. The screen indicated that the patient had only received 6 rads so far, and while the operator had ordered 202, the operator pressed P to unpause the treatment. While all this occurred in the control room, Ray laid alone in the operating room. Normally, the two zones were connected by audio and video, but during this session, the video monitor had turned off and the speakers had been broken for some time. After receiving the first attempt at treatment, Ray later recounted a feeling of electric shock, or that hot coffee had been poured down his back. Being his ninth treatment, Ray knew something was wrong, so he got up from the table at the exact same time the operator unpaused the Therac-25. He ran to the door of the control room screaming and pounded on the door, visibly shaken and upset. Simulations after the incident estimate that Ray Cox received not 180 rads, but somewhere between 16,000 and 25,000. Ray Cox in the following weeks would feel excruciating pain in his neck and shoulders, suffer from several types of paralysis, and eventually die to complications five months later. Five other patients in the US and Canada would suffer a similar fate. What could have gone so terribly wrong in software to cause a man to lose his life? Several assumptions about software, poor software engineering practices, and safety design choices in the Therac-25 led to these catastrophic events that were all rooted in bugs in software. In the 1980s and early 1990s, there wasn't much knowledge about how software worked outside of a small community of programmers. There was an attitude in the public that once the code worked, 
software was unable to fail. Once the code performed the function it was able to perform, there was no more work to do. Nothing could go wrong, there were no edge cases. Because of this, AECL allowed a single hobbyist programmer to program the Therac 25 alone in PDP-11 assembly. One person coded alone in assembly. This software cannot fail attitude bled into all aspects of the engineering process. The design of the Therac 25 was unnecessarily complex, and when questioned by the FDA about how much the Therac had been tested, the AECL representative reported that the Therac 25 underwent 2,700 hours of testing. When pressed for more information and data, representative backpedaled and said 2,700 hours of testing by the operators using the machine. It was later revealed that the Therac 25 was never tested until it arrived and was assembled at the hospitals where it underwent minimal system testing to prove that it functioned and nothing more. The code that was modified between the Therac 20 and the Therac 25 underwent zero regression testing, and the Therac 25 didn't come with any system level documentation about the errors so that an operator could handle them when encountered. So what happened to Ray Cox? Inside the Therac 25's code, a task ran that executed the treatment. Inside that task, a variable called tphase controlled which one of eight subroutines was being ran at any given time. When the operator first accidentally entered X-ray mode, the tphase variable quickly moved on to phase three, or the setup treatment phase. During this time, the X-ray energy specified on the user interface was used to look up and program a configuration to the digital to analog converter which would be used to emit the radiation energy to the patient. Also during this time, magnets were put into motion that would be used to bend the X-ray beam and control its output. It took about eight seconds to move this magnet. During this eight seconds, the task would ignore additional input from the user as the data entry task was not being ran. Because the operator in this case was skilled, and able to change X-ray mode to electron mode in under 8 seconds, the changes to the prescription were not observed by the machine. Instead of receiving electron radiation as prescribed, Ray received X-ray radiation at electron radiation doses, without the proper bending and mediation by the magnets. This error is known as a race condition. In a race condition, logic in a program depends on a data location that can be written to by two separate threads. The race condition exists because there is no logic controlling who is allowed to write to that data at any given time. The race happens when the logic executed on the data depends on what piece of code gets there first. In the Therac 25, the race condition caused the data entry to occur before the patient setup task was able to read it, causing a misconfiguration in the machine that was not accounted for previously by the programmer. This would not have been a problem in previous versions of the Therac where hardware interlocks were there to make sure that these levels of radiation did not come out. But to make the Therac cheaper, these hardware interlocks were removed and the system depended entirely on software checks to make sure this didn't happen. In code, it should be accepted that bugs will happen, ones that you're aware of and ones that you can never predict. Rigorous code testing should always occur, especially in systems where lives depend on software safety. Now, NASA has 10 rules for writing safe software. If you wanna learn about those rules, go check out this video. We'll see you next time.